What we're going to do now is go through a number of questions that were asked for people to send in, which they have, and it's really given us a chance to um, think about some of the answers before we give them to you, which is quite helpful. Um, um, so what we've got to do is we've, we've, we've arranged for, I'm going to pass the microphone around so that people, other people get a chance to speak apart from just me, and also it's relevant to their own areas of expertise. So the first group of questions are to Dr. McFarland, um, who's going to deal with them. Uh, for those of you that don't know, <laughs> <laughs> Dr. McFarland's a paediatric neurologist who has a major interest in childhood mitochondrial disease. And whilst this isn't relevant to everybody, it's certainly relevant to some people. OK, thank you very much. Right. So the first question for me are, are headaches linked to Lee's disease? So Lee's disease is a particular form of mitochondrial disease that affects children, uh, generally. Uh, but it can uh, affect people right through into adult life. Um, headaches specifically aren't linked with Lee's syndrome, but some of the complications of Lee's may lead to having headaches. So Lee's can affect sleep, um, and people with uh, Lee disease can sometimes uh, have poor sleep quality and poor breathing when they're asleep. And that poor breathing when they're asleep leads to a rise in carbon dioxide in their body and that can lead to dilatation of blood vessels and cause headaches first thing in the morning. Okay? Those headaches usually resolve within a sort of half hour of waking in the morning. But Lee's disease of itself is not particularly a cause of headaches. The second question I have is, is a child's growth affected in mitochondrial disease? Uh, and generally the answer to that is, yes, it, it is. Um, there are lots of different forms of mitochondrial disease where growth is affected. Um, it's not that children are actually deficient of growth hormone, uh, which is the, the hormone that does help us grow. But children with any chronic disease often have a delay in the onset of their puberty. And puberty is when we have a huge uh, growth spurt uh, that, that helps us attain our final adult height. As you can see, I didn't really get to that stage. <laughs> um, all right, I didn't need to laugh quite so much. <laughs> so, so there are some interventions we can, people have tried uh, growth hormone replacement, even though it hasn't been demonstrated to be deficient. And actually, that doesn't make a huge difference, uh, if any at all, to the final height of these children. And the final question, uh, are there information leaflets about children uh, and fatigue for schools? There are no specific uh, leaflets that I'm aware of. We have in Newcastle been working on a handbook for patients. Um, and in that handbook, some of which uh, we've we've given out already for feedback from, from you. Uh, in that handbook, there, are, uh, there, there is some information on uh, fatigue and various other aspects of mitochondrial disease that might be relevant to uh, children going to school to inform their teachers, to inform other uh, pupils, to inform um, any other professionals that they come into contact with. Many children that I see in clinic also have physiotherapists, have occupational therapists, speech and language therapists who see them while they're at school. Okay, thank you. Okay, and I think it's worth just saying that, that some of you will have known, I um, don't know if Matt's still here, but we are building a new website for, no, other Matt. Uh, right, so Matt at the back who's waving now. So Matt's involved in building a new website for patients with um, mitochondrial disease and designing a new website which we hope will contain an awful lot more information including a lot more information on children. We are anticipating that that will be start, we're starting that project now but we'll get something on the web in the next couple of months and then we will be building up the information so that you will have a one place where you can go. For those of you without computers, and I realize that there are some people without computers, we will produce written forms of that information available, as we do now. OK. Thank you very much. Dr. Gorman, we'll let you go to the front. OK. Um, so the next set of questions are actually quite specific questions. Have you ever sent them in? First one, is there any relationship between your kidney function and mitochondrial disease? 
Well, if you actually look at the literature and you look at people coming to the clinic, there is a link between mitochondrial disease and kidney function. We're currently under do, um, undertaking research collaboratively with London and some of you, quite a lot of you, because we had over 100 people participated in a research study looking at urine in people with a certain particular form of mitochondrial disease. So that was the specific people with the 3243 mutation. And there is a relationship between already known to link between it and certain forms of kidney disease. So some people here also will know there's a thing called focal sclerosing glomerulonephritis. And that in itself means your kidneys don't work as well. It's usually the blood vessels within the kidney are affected with that. Within our cohort of people attending the clinic, we have noticed probably about six to seven percent of people don't have perfectly normal kidney function. And we looked at that looking at certain things in their blood. So looking at your sodium, so roughly about six or seven percent have abnormal sodium. And that may be, not definite, but may be an indication of kidney dysfunction. That also goes with a lot of tablets which people are on, things like carbamazepine or tegretol, and also ACE inhibitors. So you can see it's hard to discern is it tablet related or if it's actually kidney function. That's really the, one of the new areas that we're starting to look at. With regards to our cohort, how many people have had overt kidney failure? Well, we have two families that have a main presentation of kidney, um, two adults that have had a transplant and one child who successfully had a transplant last year. Of those one adults, one also had a combined pancreatic and kidney transplant because they were both diabetic as well as kidney failure. When you look at the group of patients, even in the literature, who have mitochondrial disease, the percentages are roughly about the same as we see within our group of patients. So back to what I was saying when we look at the cohort, that's been extremely helpful at looking back at people and showing us where else we need to look. One of the other questions was, um, okay. There was, another, there was another question that was given to me that had come in um, asking what we actually screened for in the clinic with regards to kidney function. Um, so for the person that answered, just so that I answer that for you, we really only look at your bloods in the clinic on a yearly basis. So we check your kidney function, the two. That is really what we look at is your urea, so what the waste product and creatinine. That's affected by your body weight and your mass. That's why we weigh you in clinic. So it's not just saying, oh, you're within the normal range. For a period of time, Dr. McFarlane was leading a study where we screened a lot of people's urine, looking at what's your urinary creatinine ratio, so the, between the two that sometimes can give you an indication of before your blood starts to become abnormal that the kidneys aren't working right. And we didn't have a huge amount of hugely abnormal. But I think given what we will do in collaboration with London and what the results show, we may be more active about screening for kidney function. But on the whole, most people's kidney function is normal but there are about six, probably it'll go up to 10% of people we may need to be a bit more careful with. So that's about one in 10 people will get kidney, slight kidney problems. Most of it will be asymptomatic. There'll be relatively few people that will actually require something being done about the kidneys. Dr. Schaefer. Thank you. Um, so um, this uh, question sent in uh, by a patient who has MRF, um, but having said that, I, I think I can probably answer the question in relation to anybody who might have diabetes. Um, as you can see, it's a very specific question. What levels of insulin and frequency would you recommend? Um, the easy answer to that is it very much depends on the individual, and I think the important point is that you can't have a set protocol for any given patient. Some patients really just to modify their diet uh, and exercise to keep things under control. Some patients may need a little extra help with tablets to help keep the sugars uh, in place. Uh, sometimes people need insulin, and the levels of insulin can be very low levels all the way up to quite high levels, depending on what people need. Uh, the important point really is that it's monitored and kept a close eye on because diabetes doesn't actually cause many problems at all if the sugars are kept within a normal range. Okay? Diabetes causes problems if the sugars get too high and then there's what we call end organ disease, which is usually due to problems in the small blood vessels affecting the kidney, the eyes, the nerves. Um, so the important thing is to make sure that you're being assessed. So we screen for this on a regular basis. It's something that uh, is one of the uh, reasons that we actually advocate looking uh, or at least offering 
to see people in families where they might be at risk of mitochondrial disease so that we can screen for diabetes early, pick it up early and treat early to avoid the complications. Uh, it's something that often in its early stages can be looked after by the GP. If the control of a diabetes is difficult, sometimes you need referral onto a specialist in diabetes to make sure it's kept under control. Okay. Um, the next question, can stem cells be effective to help the pancreas create insulin itself? Well, there's a lot of, uh, uh, there's a lot of attention being paid to stem cells in the media for a whole host of things. Uh, stem cells um, can be used to help the pancreatic function. It has been done and tried. Um, one of the difficulties is that when you introduce um, stem cells or a transplant of any type, when it's from a different donor, usually what we call a cadaveric transplant, i.e. from somebody who has died and you take part of a pancreas and transplant it, your body's natural response is to try and reject that. And so you need immune, uh, immune suppressant drugs to try and allow you to keep that transplant. In true stem cells, it doesn't work very well because those drugs actually reduce the efficiency of the stem cells. So what is used more um, is actually a transplant of the whole pancreas or a partial uh, or part of the pancreas, and that's put into the new end of, into the patient. You leave the old pancreas in place, which is really a backup in case the new transplant fails, okay? But the new transplant aims to give more insulin production, which helps to control the diabetes. Now, this is obviously a procedure. Uh, it's not something you do lightly, and at the moment, it's only really done in quite severe cases. Okay, it can be done in patients who uh, it can be done just as a pancreatic transplant, or in some patients, because as earlier mentioned, diabetes can harm the kidney function. In people who have very bad kidney function and maybe require dialysis, they may have a combined pancreas and kidney transplant. But again, it, it requires immunosuppressants to damp down the immune system. So it's not something you would undertake lightly. It may be in the future, it becomes a much more straightforward procedure, and that's always hopeful for people with diabetes. So at the moment, most of our patients do not require that. Okay, we do, we have one patient that was mentioned earlier who's had a pancreatic and renal transplant, kidney transplant as well. Okay. Thank you very much. And it's just clear that we do work very close, Dr. Schaefer and, my, and my, Dr. Mafal and Dr. Gorman and myself work very closely with the diabetic specialists. Often, you know, when you people come up to the clinic for any specialty, the letters and the information is passed between the relative specialties to make sure that we're optimizing your treatment. Okay, the next, the next uh, areas of um, things come back to some of the points that were certainly raised before. Um, uh, Dr. Schaefer's talked about stem cells. Um, clearly, there's an awful lot of work being done around stem cells. Um, but, but there's a great deal of interest within the uh, medical profession. It's called regenerative medicine. You know, can we grow stem cells which will grow back bits of brain, for example, for patients with Parkinson's disease? as Dr. Schaefer's mentioned, new cells to make insulin. Clearly, mitochondrial disease is one of those diseases that could respond to stem cell therapy. I think where we are at the moment is we're waiting for the best way that we could potentially replace cells, and that's some way off. And it's not our group that's doing that sort of research. There are whole stem cell institutes, just like we're an institute of mitochondrial, look, studying mitochondrial disease, there's whole stem cell institutes. We have close links with those groups, and if anything comes along that we think would be useful, we'd certainly be very keen to offer it to our patients. There's been quite a lot of talk about the IVF, and I know that in the focus group, uh, Lindsay and Laura were talking about some of this, and Professor Herbert. Um, I mean, where we're at at the moment is that we do need to do three things. We need to prove that the technique that we're using is safe and effective. Um, we need to get Parliament to say yes. And the third thing, which is a bit more difficult, is that there needs to be some further experiments done on animal models. 
And this is something that, that, that the regulators are going to insist on. So we hope, and um, I think this really comes down to uh, not how good Lindsay and Laura are, because they're very good. It really comes down to just how many eggs we're going to get donated for research. Because unless we get the eggs donated for research, we can't see whether or not the techniques are effective. <coughs> Theoretically, this could be something that could be present in the next two to three years. But it is going to take us two years to, at least to get this through Parliament. So I think that's probably what you were saying as well, Lindsay, was it, right? So um, the next thing is, there was some discussion. So, so everybody that comes to, uh, anybody of childbearing age that comes to the clinic, we should have the discussion about the transmissibility of their disease. There are options, there are a number of options that are available now for lots of people that come to the clinic. It's very much tailored to the type of mitochondrial that, disease that you have. And therefore, there is embryo testing being done, and some embryos, after being tested, are being put back via an IVF procedure, and the first child born due to that has actually been born. But that is embryo testing. It's not about the transfer of the pronuclei. So, Whatever, I, I would just advise, if people are uncertain, if people are uncertain, make sure they have a word with us next time they come to the clinic. Okay, so we'll keep going. I do realise this room is getting hotter and hotter. <laughs> I, um, I, I, I'm nearly at the stage where I'm going to have to take my jacket off, right? So I, I don't know if, if, if there's any windows, well, no, there's no windows, is there? Um, <laughs> If you could all blow in one direction, maybe. Yeah, we've not got too much longer to go, so it'll soon cool down. Right, back to Dr. McFarlane. We're taking these in turns, so. Okay, so the first question here is, um, are there any research results into over-exercise with Lee's disease? Um, I think the, the, the premise of this question is that, that one can over-exercise, and, and young children, anyone who's watched young children, knows that actually they, they run around like mad things and in fact it's very difficult to control what they do. It's very difficult to control what they do generally actually. Um, never mind whether they participate in any exercise regimes or, or control the amount of exercise that they do. And in fact that's because their bodies are very good at regulating that. So if they experience fatigue they tend to stop, have a nap um, and recharge their batteries. So in fact researching into over-exercise in, in children uh, has not been done, partly because it's not really felt to be a, a problem um, that they experience, but, but something that actually they're very good at regulating themselves. The next question is um, a boy aged six, uh, sleeping 10 to 11 hours per night, plus two hours nap during the day. Is this good for energy levels? Okay, so at about the age of six, I mean, children all require uh, much more sleep than, than adults do. And um, at the age of six, an average night's sleep for a child will be somewhere between nine and 12 hours a night, and there's a bit of variability in that. So sleeping 10 to 11 hours at night at the age of six is not unusual. Um, what is perhaps slightly unusual is that this child's having a two-hour nap in the afternoon. Young children under the age of five often do have a nap um, in the afternoon. And it's probably just that this child is maturing a little bit uh, more slowly than, than peers in terms of uh, energy expenditure. Young children, as I say, under the age of five will often have a nap in the afternoon, recharge the batteries. If this child has mitochondrial disease, and I'm not sure who this child is, but if they do, then the fact that they're still at the age of six needing a nap in the afternoon is reflective of the fact that they've got mitochondrial disease. I might expect that with time that will improve as well. Okay. I'm left in you've, charge. you've been left in charge of that. <laughs> oh dear. Okay. okay, so the next question is recurrent E. coli. So it's a certain bug in your urine. Is it safe to take monotrim, which is trimethoprim? 
uh, low dose at night time? Very specific question. The answer to that simply is yes, that's fine. The next question is also very specific, obviously, who sent this question in. And um, I had to literally, truth is, I had to go and refresh my memory what the sting procedure was. It's been a long time since I did a renal job when I was training. So just to tell you what it is, so obviously whoever has submitted this question has a child that's having reflux um, bladder-wise. <laughs> this is my computer, you can see Newcastle. Newcastle have just kicked off, so I've got to go. Sorry about that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Get that in there. Sorry about that. <laughs> Th Obviously thank goodness it was only that. <laughs> <laughs> so, so that's not what the sting procedure is. <laughs> so the sting procedure, so literally, um, if you think about your urinary tract, it's your bladder and your kidneys, and there's two little tubes come into your bladder when you make urine by the kidneys, and then the bladder pushes it out to the outside. The connection between your bladder and the little tube from the kidney has a little valve and particularly in young children, usually young boys, there can be a faulty valve. And if the urine, which is usually sterile, starts to go back up the tubes, you can get recurrent kidney infection. So recurrent kidney infection obviously isn't a good thing because long term it can lead to scarring and um, malfunction of your kidney. Different ways of actually treating them. One of it is the sting procedure. Whoever submitted this question, just to say, this is not usually a common association with um, mitochondrial myopathy or mitochondrial disease. Uh, usually children that have this uh, reflux can run in families. Usually about a third have a family history of it, but it can occur uh, on its own. And literally what you do is you inject this little bit of substance into the valve between the bladder and the little tubes, and that sort of stops the reflux back. And really, I've already addressed the last question because I knew it was somewhere. What usual tests we've done have already covered that. So we usually screen bloods, not commonly urine. But obviously, if someone does have a problem with their kidneys, we will check a urine sample as well. Thank you. Uh, thank you again. Um, so. Um can the fatigue be reduced by anything? Um, so I think this applies to a lot of patients with mitochondrial disease. I'm sure Gronya has talked at length in her focus group about fatigue. Uh, so some of you will have already heard some of this. Um, uh, I think the first and most important point, uh, although fatigue is very common in mitochondrial disease, Fatigue can be very common for a whole host of reasons. Okay, so um, I think it's important to remember that patients with mitochondrial disease are not immune to other conditions or other factors, and that applies for a whole host of symptoms. Um, so before we naturally assume it's the mitochondrial disease, I think it's worthwhile just looking at lifestyle uh, and other factors to see if there's anything that can be corrected that improve that, and also just to be aware of other conditions, which you don't specifically need to be aware of as such, but it's something that your GP may want to check just to get other issues out of the equation. So it's not unusual sometimes for people to be slightly anemic uh, for a variety of reasons. In some situations, that might be perfectly acceptable because the reason is apparent. In others, if somebody's anemic, that might require certain investigations. But you wouldn't want to miss that just by assuming it's mitochondrial disease before looking at other factors. So I think it is important to attend the GP surgery first and just get other things checked out. Um, Equally, thyroid problems, people who are hypothyroid may be fatigued. This is actually quite common in the general population. Patients with mitochondrial disease can get that as well as a completely separate issue. So it's important to look at these because they're completely treatable. Um, some people sleep poorly at night. Some people suffer from obstructive sleep apnea, particularly if people are a little overweight with a thick neck. Um, so people can be at risk of that, and that's something that can be treated. People on a variety of medications might be drowsy and fatigued because of side effects of the medications. So it's always worth looking at, has it come on since something was started? So all of these things need to be addressed. If it is, with all these things excluded, mitochondrial disease, then we often try coenzyme Q10 for patients. Again, Patrick Chinnery talked earlier on about the trials and the studies. There isn't good evidence for this, but in our experience, maybe about a third of patients find it really quite useful. The other two-thirds are either not sure or don't, but it's worth trying because there aren't side effects. 
exercise, whether it's graded exercise programs or specific exercise, as Gronje's um, probably already talked about, can be quite helpful with that fatigue as well. Uh, so the next one, how can I stay awake after an evening meal as soon as I relax and I start nodding off? Well, again, this might not be related to mitochondrial disease. We, I can see a few people in the audience smiling, right? Uh, I think uh, as you get older, as we get older, uh, you start to notice things like that creeping up. So it may just be actually energy expenditure, but again, it's worth looking at whether you've slept reasonably at night. Because by definition at night, when you're asleep, you don't remember things. People with obstructive sleep apnea, for instance, can be breaking their sleep cycles, but without remembering that that's occurring. So people who snore loudly, people who sound to their partner, if they stop for a second, so you're lying there wanting to kill them because they're snoring, and then you think they have died, and then you go, and then they start again and you want to kill them again. And that's obstructive sleep apnea. So it's kind of snore, 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 and then Right? Okay. So that's often the case, and, and it's worth being aware of that because that's something that can be treat, treated. So, so that's not an unusual cause. Sometimes it's, if you have a smaller meal, that won't happen as often as well. And sometimes, of course, just having a cup of coffee might help you sort of keep awake, but make sure it doesn't keep you awake during the night. Um, why do my legs and feet explode with heat as soon as I'm in bed? Okay, assuming uh, you haven't got a very small bedroom and you haven't got an electric fire at the end of a bed. Um, uh, this is a very specific question to one individual person who's obviously sent it in. But, and I suppose I would say this is not me diagnosing it, because as you know with doctors, we all need to ask certain questions, examine whoever it is and make sure. But there are things that can cause those sort of symptoms. Uh, one of them is a neuropathy, which means damage to the nerve endings in the feet. That can occur as a result of mitochondrial disease, as a result of diabetes, or as a result of a whole host of other things. But that can sometimes uh, cause a sort of odd burning type sensation in the feet, uh, an intolerance of different temperatures or sensations. Uh, another thing that you can suffer from, sometimes with a neuropathy or as a result of a neuropathy, is something called restless leg syndrome, which you may have heard about. This is a kind of build-up of an unpleasant sensation in the legs that you just really feel like you need to move them. And once you move them, you get a certain degree of relief, even though the symptoms may come back again. And that's often when you're sitting quietly, relaxed, or lying in bed. So those are two things. Again, it needs to be checked out. There are things such as iron deficiency anemia can make restless legs more likely to occur, and replacing the iron will often cure that. So it needs to be looked at, uh, but those are probably some of the commoner sort of things that might produce those sort of symptoms. Okay, thank you. Um, right, um, so I, I, um, a couple of questions which are to start with about developments in drug therapy to improve quality of life was obviously a question that was sent in before uh, we had Professor Chinry talk about this and where we're up to and there are a number of drugs out there that we hope to start doing clinical trials on to see whether or not they really do work. Um, is research being done for nuclear DNA related mitochondrial conditions? The answer is yes. Um, we have got specific programs which target some patients who've got mitochondrial DNA disease and some which target patients who've got nuclear DNA disease. Some of the techniques or either drugs or exercise may well benefit both. So we're not, some are very specific for specific sorts of mitochondrial disease, some are likely to be much more effective overall. So the answer is yes, we are doing research. Um, the final point is, um, and this is something that uh, I have to say that, that we um, uh, have been very grateful that patients, um, some patients when they have died with mitochondrial disease or family members have died, they've donated their bodies to medical research. Um, I mean, this is something that, that we as doctors often don't like to ask because it, you know, we all hope that our patients are going to live forever. Of course, none of us are going to live forever. And it is extremely valuable because one of the things that we need to do is actually understand more about mitochondrial disease. And one of the things that both Dr. Gorman and uh, Professor Chinry stressed is that we're really trying hard to develop new treatments 
But it's like anything else, you know, it's difficult, for example, to fix a car if you don't know what's wrong with it. And understanding the sort of problems that patients have is crucial for our development of the next generation of treatment. So yes, anybody who feels, well, look, actually, I would, you know, if anything happens to me, I would quite like to leave my body to research or Dr. Schaefer in the past, is, you know, if you're ever going in for operations or things, it's often very useful for us to have samples of tissue so that we can do research on that tissue. So, yes, that's certainly something that we would we'd be very keen and we can talk to individual people about and give relevant forms. Again, very important that you consent to these, these sort of procedures and it's much better to consent before before there, you know, things are imminent, say with an operation, to consent before. So that's something that we would encourage people to do. I think we're back to Dr. Schaefer. Okay. Yes. Okay, thank you again. Um, okay, so uh, are there any new treatments for MELAS? Um, so um, uh, this has really been covered in many ways by Patrick's talk, so I'll, I'll keep it quite quick. Uh, and the, the answer really is no, not at the moment. Um, he put some things up that have been tried in the past, which have unfortunately either shown no benefit, things like ubiquinone, or at least no proven benefit, I ought to say, because of often these trials are small, because mitochondrial disease is certainly in the past has been considered to be quite a rare condition. We and other groups have shown that it's much more common than was previously thought, but still to do the studies, you often need a uniform group of patients, uh, which means that mitochondrial disease as a whole is perhaps more common. But then when you cut it down into MELAS and MRF, and single deletions and things, the numbers become smaller. Um, there was a drug called dichloroacetate that was tried, looked quite hopeful, but unfortunately the side effects by far outweighed the problems, so that has gone by the by. There are some studies into a drug called L-arginine, um, which is used to try and prevent the, or, or reduce the effects of stroke-like episodes, but the results of that to date are, are somewhat equivocal and really further studies are needed uh, to prove that that helps. Uh, I think the current practice, and what is very important, is that in patients with MELAS uh, and other types of mitochondrial disease, if they are prone to seizures, that we treat those seizures quickly and as effectively as we can. Okay, so. Um, that's one of the important things, also trying to treat infections and dehydration as quickly and effectively as we can. And the aim being to optimise the situation to prevent the stroke-like um, events happening. Um, and is there any ongoing research treatment for cerebellar ataxia? Well, cerebellar ataxia just means that there is problems with balance and coordination due to the cerebellum, the back part of the brain. That's not specific to mitochondrial disease. There are lots of diseases that cause that, but mitochondrial disease can as well. Um, there have been one or two trials in other types of cerebellar problems, not specifically in mitochondrial disease, and there aren't any at the moment. One of the difficulties with it is really to treat the underlying cause. What we're talking about is treating the mitochondrial disease itself, which we've already talked about is difficult. Treating the ataxia itself is very, very difficult because the cerebellum, the back part of the brain, communicates every little thing that you do. It makes sure your eyes are locked into your head movements. It makes sure that you know exactly where your arms and legs are in space, even if you've got your eyes closed. And actually to try and prevent that when it's present is something that's very, very difficult in terms of, I'm um, not sure if Jane's uh, about, but in terms of physiotherapy, it's not like trying to retrain a weak leg to make it stronger, because often by the time a leg is out of place and you're off balance, it's almost too late to correct it and you either underdo or overdo the correction. So it can be quite difficult in that respect. Okay. Um some more questions which are quite general, which um, I think is really important. Um, it was done nationally to promote mitochondrial disease. Um, um, I think it's something that many of us feel passionately about because um, I think as a group of patients, you are underrepresented. Um, I think what happens is because everybody's fragmented, um, the kind of national organisation isn't perhaps there that we need to try and create, and this is one of the things that we're trying to do. Um, um, 
some of us um, have recently been awarded a very large grant by the Wellcome Trust. The Wellcome Trust is the largest um, uh, medical charity in the world and in the UK there are nine Wellcome Trust centres and we've just become the ninth centre. And I say the Wellcome Trust is a huge charity that's worth about 12 billion pounds. So um, don't worry, that's not all coming to us, if only it was. <laughs> we cure mitochondrial disease. But I'm just saying that what it means is that we've now got the resources of the Wellcome Trust that are supporting us with people like Matt to just really start to put this on the map. And it's interesting that um, two things, that this is getting to people at the highest level of government. So when we've been doing this work with the IVF procedure, the head of the Wellcome Trust had a word with, um, um, with the uh, head of the, the um, Secret Secretary of State for Business, David Willits, and when David Cameron came to the northeast of England, we were able to talk to him specifically about mitochondrial disease. And this is what's really important, because of course David Cameron had a son who was handicapped, and therefore he does have an interest in rare disorders. And I think that's one of the things that we're trying to do. We're also working with the Wellcome Trust to try and develop a better way of describing mitochondrial disease and trying to make it much easier for people to understand. So we are working very, very hard to promote mitochondrial disease in the UK. Um, as regards the medical profession, um, when I was um, a medical student, I won't tell you how many years ago, but um, well, it was about, <laughs> it was more than 35 because I've had my 35 year medical school reunion. So, yeah, so, so a mitochondria was something that was in a textbook. So my generation of doctors just don't know anything about mitochondrial disease. It's now something that we are teaching the medical students, but don't forget that doctors have to learn lots about lots of conditions. And it's incredible how the knowledge has just expanded. Both uh, our daughters are junior doctors, but both my wife and our daughters are both junior doctors. Um, and they have so much more to learn than I did. So I think it's, it's difficult for doctors to be up to date with everything. It's one of the things that we very, feel very passionately about is informing doctors, but also by creating things like our logbooks, which is something that Dr. McFarland and Sister Feeney have been working very hard on, is to try and generate these books. And what we mean by logbooks, those of you that have had, had children will know that when you're pregnant, you walk around with a book that keeps all your details in. It's precisely what we're trying to create for patients with mitochondrial disease. And this is well into development. We're into the development stage. We're hoping to roll this out this year sometime, aren't we? So in essence, you'll all get your own logbook that you'll walk around with all of our letters in and everything else so that you can take it round so that people can know. And the final thing is about Ireland. Um, can people in Ireland participate in research? Yes. Um, it's difficult to organise this all around the country and different countries and we're sorry that, they, that often people have a different kind of health service. Um, it's impossible for us to go to Ireland to organise something like this. Um, it's difficult enough for people from this country to come all the way to Newcastle. So it's one of the things that we're just trying to get around this by putting more information out there, specifically on the internet. Okay, so um, I think Catherine's going to answer some of these because I don't think Jane was expecting this. So, <laughs> but, but 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 you can. Yeah, yeah, I'll answer them, Jane, if that's all right. It was mainly just um, to say that if you do have problems where you, you've you've got problems with your walking and you want a walking stick or any kind of mobility aid, the same as a stair lift, really. If you highlight that to any of us in clinic, because when the doctors are doing their letters to the GP, that's the time that we'll get them to do that, because we have to make the referral to the GP. Okay.
Okay, so just repeat that, that, that Jane's saying that district nurses, some district nurses can help, but services have to be done locally now, so it's very important that you deal with this. We can give very strong recommendations and often follow it up with a phone call. That was the, the reason that I wanted to bring it up, J Jane, was because I think everybody thinks, oh, it's a walking problem or something. I'll have to see the physiotherapist, but you can't make that referral, so we need to know so that the clinicians can do that. Okay. Um, Rosemary. Right, the first one is financial help for a carer for my husband. Who should I speak to? Well, the first thing you should be looking at is claiming the benefit that's appropriate, which is disability living allowance. Once the person who needs the care is awarded the middle or higher rate of the care component, then someone else can apply for the carer's allowance. But you can't apply for the carer's allowance unless you've got that middle or higher rate of the care component for DLA in place. But separate to that, there's the whole thing about going to adult services to ask for a carer's assessment for the person who is providing your care. You, as the person who needs care, can have an assessment from adult services for provision of services to you. But what a lot of people don't know is that their carer can also apply for an assessment. And they might quite separately be awarded six hours a week or something. So they can get out, they can get a break, and you can have a sitter in to look after you or the person you're caring for. Second one is, my vision is poor, can someone help me with forms to apply for DLA? And I'm sure a lot of you have seen the forms that you need to apply for DLA. Certainly, I mean, you can contact Catherine and come to myself or go to your local welfare rights service or Citizens Advice Bureau. There's been a lot of talk about the fact how we need to make the medical profession aware of mitochondrial disease. Believe me, we need to make the Department for Work and Pensions aware of what mitochondrial disease is. So what I would be always saying is, please don't struggle to fill in the forms by yourself. Get professional help to fill in the forms because professional welfare benefits advisors know what are the important things to get down. But the second thing is, please ask for supporting evidence. And I always, the doctors have always been extremely helpful. We've had a number of successes simply because we've been able to provide a report from a consultant that says, this is what mitochondrial disease is. This is how it affects my patient. But otherwise, as I say, the decision makers in the Department for Work and Pensions are not medically qualified. And they won't go chasing around after evidence. You have to submit it. So don't think just by putting your consultant's name on the form that they'll write to the consultant. Sometimes they do. All too often they think, well, there's nothing here. They're not going to get the benefit. If you get turned down for benefit, if you think I've been awarded too low a rate of a benefit, get advice. Because again, we can ask them to look at that decision again. If you have deteriorated, get advice. But certainly, vision impairment is one of the things that, as your sight deteriorates, if you can't see the edges of steps, if you can't um, make your way around the house without putting your hands out to feel where you're going, that's the sort of thing we should be looking at. And finally, other than deafness, I manage pretty well. Can I claim DLA? You can claim disability living allowance if you have a hearing <coughs> impairment, because it's all about bodily functions and hearing and seeing are bodily functions. So once again, get advice. If you've got a good local welfare rights service, go to them. But unfortunately, benefits advice is one of the areas that's being cut across the country. You can certainly ask Catherine for my number and talk to me. I'll give you advice and you'll be amazed at what we can do over the telephone. Thanks, Derek. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. I, I just... Yeah. Uh, sorry, just to clarify as well, just because the other day in clinic somebody presented me with a very straightforward form, took me two minutes and asked what the charge was. We do not charge, okay, for giving letters of support and filling out these sort of forms that are intended for doctors. So don't be afraid to ask thinking you're going to get a bill, okay? We're more than happy and delighted to, okay? Okay. Uh, 
Um, just take them all to Dr. Schaefer. <laughs> um, um, I, I just want to say that one of the things that we, we do provide mechanic, as much as Rosemary can be there, is that you can come and you can come and see myself or Dr. McFarland or, or, or Sister Feeney, but you can also see Rosemary at the clinic. Or if she's not there, then we will give you contact. It's one of the things that we are providing specifically for our mitochondrial patients. So this is a service we are providing for you. We'll only keep providing it if people use it. And I think it's one of the things where we certainly can help people. Because as Rosemary says, people just don't understand. And unless we write the right things, and to be honest, we as doctors are learning about writing the right things, then it's not going to happen for you. Okay? I think we've got one left. There you go, Catherine. So we've, talk, we've talked about the logbook before, and it's an opportunity for me to say thank you to everybody who's helped us um, recently, because you'll have probably all been bombarded with a number of questionnaires, um, and we really do appreciate that. We know it's difficult to fill things in and keep sending them back, and we're constantly bombarding you at the moment with that. But we have been um, auditing the logbook at the minute. Um, we've got sent the final um, questionnaire out, and when we get that back, we're hoping that, as, as Professor Turnbull said, that we'll be be able to get that to print and get that out to you and be able to bring it to clinic fill it in and then carry it around with you it's been talked about certainly in the support group about about um, other professionals knowing less than you and this would be an aid for you to take to any appointment with you wherever you go so that will be coming soon and and the second question is about the mito card um we have actually developed a card that you can carry like a, um, a credit card in your wallet or your purse that says, I have mitochondrial disease. And something that it's taken us uh, quite a long time, <laughs> to, but we're finally there. I've brought them today, so we will distribute them. We will send them out for anybody who hasn't got them either. Um, it's a small credit card that, that will let professionals know that you have a mitochondrial disorder, and it will have our contact telephone number on for the hospital switchboard. So if you are in a situation in a hospital where you are with um, professionals who maybe aren't um, familiar with the disorder and they want some extra advice, we will um, have a, an on-call service here for the, to be able to answer those questions. So they are for you to give out to professionals. So we have got them here today. Okay. Oops, right. <laughs> I think that's it. So I hope that's been helpful. We wanted to just spend a bit of time preparing the questions and the answers ready for you, rather than it being a spontaneous thing, because it's just better and it means that we can consider the answers. Um, I think I've just got to say thank you all for coming. There is an evaluation sheet that, 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 the, um, that Sue and Bernie and Jane will give you. It would be very helpful if you could fill that in. Um, it's really about, you know, what we've got to do is continue to make these meetings better. One of the things that I'm going to fill in on mine is, please, can the temperature of the room be better, <laughs> right? Um, I think it's very helpful, both nice comments, but also comments about which weren't so clear. So we've already had a comment that somebody had difficulty seeing the, the PowerPoint presentation, for example comments where we can do better and also I think some there about the sort of things that would be helpful for the next patient information day that we do in a year's time and that can be comments about subjects that you'd like covered the format of the p patient information day and and also um, you know, timing when's a good time for the patient information day what time of day is best for example uh, whether or not you like it to be at a weekend or it's better during the week etc on that i'd like to finish i'd like to thank all the people that have helped and especially i would like to thank catherine so thank you very much catherine <laughs>